Some of us in this room had really great fathers. Some of us had really messy fathers. And so this song can sometimes be really easy to sing, and sometimes it can be super messy to sing. And so I invite you, anytime we sing this song, to change the word from father to shepherd. Because I'm pretty sure none of us had a shepherd. <laughs> so that one can't be as easily messed up. And if you did and you need another word, come see me. We'll come up with one. So what makes Jesus the good shepherd? What makes Jesus good to you? Not just because he's the opposite of bad, but because in this space, in this text, he proclaims himself as I am the good shepherd. See, Jesus is saying something. He's not like every other shepherd. He's set apart. He's different. So I started this journey this last week to dig deep into, well, what makes him a good shepherd? And I had lots of experiences this last week of Jesus being my good shepherd. But let's back up for a second and just see how he's been a good shepherd since we started this sermon series. See, in John 1, we see Jesus as a good shepherd because he was there from the beginning, laying the earth on its foundation. And that from the beginning, this good shepherd has been the light, the life, the life for all people. He's good because even darkness cannot put out his light. Even when we don't understand or when we turn away or we get caught up in our own darkness, his light isn't overcome. He's good because he's not distant. He is a God who came and dwelt among us. The text says, he pitched his tent in our mess. <laughs> Chaos. And he made his home in it. Then you jump to John 2 and we see that he's good because he's the God of the party. When the party and all its inhabitants became overcome by scarcity, Jesus took a moment to reveal the abundance of God. Not only would we have wine, but we would have a 2013 single, uh, Silver Oak single vintage Napa Cabernet. <laughs> and not just one bottle or a Magnum, but three barrels. Or if you like soda, soda. It's fine. Whatever you need it to be. <laughs> that when we think the world is about how much from a single pie we can get, how many slices could be ours, Jesus brings a buffet of pies and says, listen, grace and beauty and love and light and life are a part of the abundant life of God. And it's a buffet where we're not all fighting for individual pieces. We eat until we're full. In chapter three, we see that Jesus is good because he gives us life everlasting. That through Jesus, we will not perish. We see that Jesus actually didn't come to condemn this world or to judge us, but that through him, all people would be saved. He's good because even when we're confused 
and questioning like Nicodemus, and we sneak to him in the dark, and we begin to ask our questions and express our fears. He doesn't make fun of us and he doesn't judge us. He answers our questions. And even when we still don't get it, he has faith in us. Chapter four, we see that Jesus is a good shepherd because he's most present to the people the rest of us ignore. The lonely, the sinner, the broken, those with a reputation. He not only meets us where we are, but he doesn't leave us the way he found us. He's good because he's the water of life that nourishes us and parches the thirst of our bellies, but doesn't just stop there, actually begins to quench the thirst of our souls. He's good because he doesn't just stop there. He won't stop sharing his grace with us until our whole community is transformed by the way of love, even when that community is one that's despised by every neighbor around it. It's good because he doesn't walk around those neighborhoods, but he walks through them. He's good because he speaks the truth to us in love, in the same way he did to the woman at the well. In chapter 5, we see that Jesus is good because he's willing to break generational rules and laws in order for us to experience the power of love. He's good because he didn't just walk past people on their bedrolls, begging on corners, but instead he looks at them, he acknowledges who they are, and he calls them up and healed. He's good because he sees what thousands of others who strolled by missed. An actual human being needing help. He's good because he reminds us that the Sabbath is actually meant for healing. It's actually meant for all of us to be restored, for being awakened to new life. He's good because he reveals to us that the entirety of the scriptures are all about him and that we frequently miss the forest for the trees because we're looking at scriptures to reveal something other than the goodness of the shepherd. We're looking for ways to keep people out and Jesus keeps revealing that he's creating a multitude of ways to get people in. In chapter six, we see he's good because he knows he can't hear, that we can't hear the messages that he gives us when we have empty stomachs and tired bodies. He recognizes that our physical needs open us up to spiritual understanding. He's good because he cares about nourishing the fullness of us. And he's good because he can take the little things that we bring to the table and multiply them to the point of having 12 extra baskets. He's good because he's patient with us, even when we miss what he's been trying to say for days and weeks and years, and he doesn't stop talking because he's annoyed with us. He keeps telling us again and again, I am, I am. I'm the bread, I'm the light, I'm the life, I'm the gate, I'm the way. I am, I am. In chapter seven, we see Jesus is good because even to the religious leaders who were stuck in their tradition and were trying to protect their organizations and their power within the culture which they resided, he was still patient with them. He kept trying to help them understand the things that they had been longing to know for generations, but because of the rules that they were holding, they couldn't find it and see it. He's good 
Because when we try to put Jesus in a box, he jumps out of it and says, I'm bigger than you think I am. I'm bigger than this one thing can contain. I'm bigger than your mind can hold. See, there's no box we can place Jesus in that he's not greater than. Chapter 8, we see Jesus is good because even when someone's caught in the middle of sin and dragged before him, he still doesn't judge, but instead offers grace. In fact, the love is so strong that as he offers it, those who were ready to throw rocks drop their stones and walk away. He's good because he reminds us that we're tied down to the mundane, yet he is in touch with what's beyond our horizon. That we live in terms of what we can see and touch, but Jesus is living on other terms. He reminds us that we're missing God in all of this tit-for-tat and judgmental way of being Christian. He's good because he reminds us that abundance and life is found in forgiveness. In chapter 9, Jesus is good because he's the source of abundant life, first to the man born blind, giving him a new existence, a new way of seeing the world. He's good because he finds the man born blind after the man had been thrown out of the temple. He's good because the disciples needed to see that because they were soon going to be thrown out. And they needed to remember that Jesus would find them too. Jesus is good because he knows his sheep and he calls them by name. Like Lazarus, out of a dead tomb. And like his sisters, Mary and Martha, who were caught up in their grief. And like Mary Magdalene. Now all of this goodness Simply by chapter 10. We've not even gotten to the cross and the resurrection yet. But then as he proclaims his goodness as shepherd, Jesus reminds us that his goodness is even greater. If you hear nothing else today, hear this. God's not done. God's not done. Do you think he's done? He's not. First, God calls people from all walks of life, every nation on the face of the earth, from every and each generation across nearly 2,000 years since Jesus first uttered these words until today. If that weren't true, you and I wouldn't be in this space today. The good shepherds at work in our midst and through us and our congregations to extend this invitation of abundant life offered by the good shepherd to everyone we meet. Can you imagine that God is using your lives and your words to invite others to faith? Can you imagine that by simply praying for someone or inviting someone to church, we actually might be the vessel that God uses to continue to show his goodness to the world around us. Jesus is good because he reminds us in this chapter that the members who will one day constitute Jesus' flock are way beyond our imagination. If all you can think about is this little box, Jesus says we won't fit in the box either. See, there's an tremendous expansiveness to the Jesus statement here. Just like the universe is ever expanding, so is the flock of his kingdom. And we don't know because Jesus nor John told us what the limits of that fold actually are going to be. So let's stop pretending that we do. All we know is that Jesus and therefore God is not done yet. Jesus is still calling. 
Jesus is still searching. And in time, we're going to be all one flock because the good shepherd's not done yet. God works in ways beyond of our imagination to bring together one flock and that Jesus is Christ's mercy and grace are for all. So what makes me bold to proclaim even though I don't know the fate of those around me? It's because I'm not your good shepherd. If you've been confusing that, let me tell you I'm the hired hand. Jesus is the good shepherd. So that kid that you're worried about, your son or your granddaughter or that long lost friend who you think has completely walked away, he's not done yet. Some of us in this room who think that we're too far gone, that we've lost our connection to God, it's not done yet. Because he's our good shepherd. Amen.